you are tuned in to In the Studio here at Davis Media Access. Thanks for joining us. My name is Autumn Labbe Renault, and joining me today is Dr. Michelle Hawkins, who's the director at the UC Davis Raptor Center. Thanks so much for joining us, Michelle. Hi, thank you for inviting me back, Autumn. It's good to see you again. Likewise, and last time we chatted, we were actually in the physical studio at Davis Media Access, and you had a really big bird. Unfortunately, we can't <laughs> do that today, but we're we're really glad to yes. catch up on uh, some recent developments at the Raptor Center. So first, and importantly, you have a big anniversary coming up next year. So tell us a little bit about how and when the Raptor Center started and, and what its trajectory has been kind of to this point. Yeah, so in 2022, we will be celebrating our 50th anniversary of the California Raptor Center. And so we're really excited about that. I'm working on all of our celebratory uh, things right now. Hopefully if COVID um, you know, is kind to us, we'll be able to get back in person. Uh, very soon. But it, over these 50 years, there's just been such dramatic uh, changes throughout the California Raptor Center from 50 years ago when Frank Agasawara and Alita Morazente were the first directors and were falconers really interested in helping birds that they found that were sick and injured. Uh, two, four directors later, I'm the fifth director. Uh, we've had directors that have brought all kinds of different strengths to the programs. Some brought new facilities to the program. Some brought um, new groups to the program that we didn't work with in the past. And um, and at, and today, uh, for my time as director, I've been director since 2013. We've concentrated a lot on education and in building our educational programs even more than they were before. So not only do we rehabilitate sick and injured birds of prey, uh, but we also provide educational programs to the general public, to K through 12, and also to agencies, zoos that need training and handling these birds. Uh, so we, we try to provide as much as we can to our community and our surrounding community. And it's just been a, it's been a great 50 years and I'm so, just so happy to have been able to be part of it for this long. I bet. So the Davis Enterprise recently did a very nice article on, on you, on, on the center and some of the challenges you're facing. And we'll get to those a little bit later. But one of the comments was about the generational impact. It described yeah. parents who had been there. And I, I wanted to say that that's my story, too. I first visited the Raptor Center many years ago as a student at UC Davis. And then I raised my children here in Davis. And, and we visited several times, too. So it, it really is a place that sticks with you. And uh, and you know that it'll be a good experience, you know, to take to take your own kids there. So that that's a pretty powerful thing. And and congratulations on helping to foster and kind of create that kind of environment. This is one I of the most satisfying ask... things about my job is to hear yeah. stories like that, Autumn. Nice, nice. I want to ask you how birds come to the center. I once my husband and I once had an experience on a on a road trip somewhere down on I-5 where we saw an injured red tail um, hawk and managed to get it in a box and find a local uh, local place down there by calling around where we could take the injured bird. Do birds come to you in this way or, or what's the process for that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, our, our, our you know, great citizens, our general community is out and about in nature, in the environment and they find these birds down. And so we often get calls of, I've found the bird, can you come and get it? Which unfortunately we don't have the capacity to do, but um, right. people can then, if they can get the bird and we can talk them through that and get it put into a box and bring it to us. And that's the start of the process. Once right. the animal gets to us and if it, the bird could either come prior to COVID the bird could either be uh, dropped off directly at the California Raptor Center or during COVID, they're all going to the veterinary medical teaching hospital first. And so okay. if it went to the Raptor Center first, the, the team out there would assess the animal, would see 
whether it needed medical care, direct medical care from the veterinarians, and if so, they bring it over to the teaching hospital. There we have faculty, residents, and students who are all working together to as a team for these birds. And so we just have the luxury at the hospital of having specialists in every field. And so if I have a very complicated orthopedic procedure, my orthopedic surgeons often will help me to figure out what's the best way forward with them. Or if we have an ocular injury, an eye injury, our ophthalmologist can really help us uh, to make sure that that bird's vision is perfect uh, before we go to release it. So once the medical care has finished or has at least the initial part of it is completed and a plan has been made for the treatment of that animal, then the bird goes back to the California Raptor Center, which is out Old Davis Road. And it's really on the, the just the south periphery of campus. And it's a very beautiful open space, quiet for the birds to be able to continue their rehabilitation. And our volunteers yeah. out there will provide the medical treatments that we've laid out for them. And then once a week, uh, the veterinarians go out and check on all the patients at the center to make sure everybody's progressing well. Also at the center, we do a lot of physical rehabilitation. And so it, that's if you've ever had a fracture, an orthopedic injury, you know how long it takes to come back from an injury like that. These birds have to right. fly for a living and most of them have come in with wing <laughs> injuries. And so they need a tremendous amount of physical therapy, which we have an integrative medicine faculty, Dr. Jamie Payton, who comes and helps us uh, doing not only physical therapy with our hands, but using ultrasound and using laser as needed uh, to be able to really help to get the soft tissues, the tendons, uh, and all the muscle surrounding the bone to also get conditioned and ready for that bird to go back. And then finally, we can check that bird, condition that bird, make sure it can really sustain what we need it to sustain out there. And then we release the bird back as close to the territory as it was found because these birds are territorial. And so if we yeah. know that it was found at the crossroads of two roads, well, we can take that bird back to that area. And if it's a safe area, we can release it back into a territory it came from. That is a well-coordinated and intensive effort. There, there's a lot of cooks in this kitchen. We have a lot, how, we have a big team. Yeah, so about how many birds come to you each year and about uh, how many of those are you able to successfully rehabilitate and release? Sure. So in general, we see several hundred birds a year. It could be anywhere from 100 birds a year to 400 birds a year, depending upon the year. We also take birds in sometimes for other facilities as well. Um, they, <clears throat> excuse me, if they have, for example, an eagle and they need to condition that eagle, they don't have a flight that's big enough for an eagle, they may transfer the bird to us and allow us to do the final conditioning, and then we'll work with that team and, and take that bird back as well. So it, it, so it can be anywhere within those numbers. Uh, in general, we, there are a lot of birds that come in, and as soon as we open the box and see just how bad their injuries are, they, they may need to be euthanized right away. And so yeah. the birds, we kind of take the birds that we, we uh, euthanize right away out of the numbers and out of the numbers that survive greater than 24 hours, we're at about a 60% success rate, which is very, very good for wildlife rehabilitation. Yeah, that's a great metric. And, you know, I know raptors are important in our overall uh, ecosystem. They they help keep vermin down. They, I mean, they, they have a lot of benefit. They're yeah. also very at risk, I would imagine, from cars, from rat poison, from, uh, you know, all, all kinds of things. What's the most common type of injury you, do, you see or, or you could guess at how they were injured? Yeah, sure. Well, the injury itself is very commonly some kind of trauma. And so collision, and we just use collision as one word um, because collision could be colliding with a car, colliding with a glass window, colliding with a wind turbine. You know, we that collisions are probably 
the number one um, reason that they're there. The question is, is why did they get into that particular situation at that moment in time? And a lot of times there's underlying problems. For example, as you were talking about, rodenticides have been a huge problem for us and are still a huge problem all over the country. Uh, we're really happy that we've got a moratorium on the use of them right now in the state of California. And there, we're trying to move a bill forward to actually have a ban on the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. They are really not available for the public use anymore, but there's still a lot of it out there. And unfortunately we see that as an underlying reason that bird's sick and maybe it's just its brain isn't functioning the way it should be functioning. Um, and it ends up in front of something or colliding with something. So mm -hmm. we, but the anticoagulant rodenticides have been a big, big problem for us. Even with the ban on lead in the state of California, we're still seeing lead cases, mostly in eagles uh, and in carrion eating birds, such as vultures. This is the, still the biggest plague for the California condor outside of fire, unfortunately. Um, but yeah. for them, the lead intoxication is still a huge problem. Fortunately, they don't get into the collisions that these birds in the urban setting get. But there are many other diseases that are underlying. And so sometimes they'll come in with a fractured wing, with a collision, but we'll know that there's something more that's just not quite right about that bird. Right. And so we will then go in and start to investigate further. And that often takes us to the reason they were sick to begin with. You mentioned COVID earlier, so let's touch briefly on, on the impacts. Um, obviously, you can't offer, you haven't been able to be open to the public and offer as many programs as you usually do. I'm wondering how you've programmatically pivoted. And then we need to get into the, the fiscal impacts you're, you're dealing with and, and how that affects operations. So let's start with programmatically. What, how have you navigated through the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, you, you used the word, right? The word of the year was pivot. And so we did have to close our gates to the general public. Uh, University of California at Davis still has a non-essential personnel rule for campus. And so for areas like ours that do have a fence, they've asked us to remain closed to the general public um, because they are quote, non-essential personnel on campus. We can't close the Arboretum but we can close the California Raptor Center, for example. So we have been closed to the public. Um, we did though pivot and try to develop virtual programs as quickly as we could. Um, we did some fundraising to be able to get some new equipment, which worked really well for us. And so we've got a very professional setup now to be able to do virtual programs. And we did a number of live programs for schools, but we also did some recorded programs that we hope we'll be able to make available as a library in the future. So actually some really good things did come out of, of us having to do things this way. Um, some of the hardships were of course, schools that were that are underfunded, Title I schools, for example, that often didn't have the technology to be able to have us come into their classroom. And so those are areas where we struggled a little bit to be able to reach some of those classrooms. But the hope is, is over time, as they get some, hopefully some of these things worked out, um, we may be able to provide programs where we don't have to go to the schools, but we can still give them some educational information. It's not the same as having a live bird, right? right. When right. the last time we met Autumn, you know, we were there and we brought a live bird into the studio and there's nothing like a student's face or a child's face when they get up close and personal with that great horned owl they've been hearing hooting in the backyard, yeah, you know, yeah. since they were two years old, right? So, um, so, so pivot was definitely what we had been working on. Um, we yeah. also, unfortunately, had on top of that, you know, fires and smoke, and that's a, been a big issue for us. Um, we have we develop protocols so that we bring in all of our resident birds when the smoke gets too bad, because there's a lot of smoke inhalation injury they could get, um, even though they're not in the density of the fires. So we had to work on that last year, and that was a real challenge for the birds. Um, yeah. And then 
finally, uh, people were desperate to get outside in the summertime last year. And so everybody was out trying to find a trail where they could walk and feel like they were in nature and not feel like they were in a Disney World line or something. Um, and <laughs> people found a lot more birds and, and brought more yeah. birds into us last year. Our nursery, we, we had twice the number of birds in the nursery as we wow. usually have. And that requires twice the manpower to feed all those little mouths, you know, some of them need to be fed every two hours at, at a certain time of their life. So we put lots of energy into things like that, into training yeah. our volunteers um, and yeah. to working on new programs for our volunteers as well. And so that was really, you know, the time that we had that was kind of downtime, um, we were able to utilize in ways like that, that we really think that all of our educational programs really have benefited overall. We just really want to see that face again, seeing that live bird. Uh, and then the other part was that our birds went uh, just a little bit feral on us. Um, the the <laughs> birds that are trained for the glove that would come into your studio, that would go out to a school, that takes a substantial amount of training with that bird for it to be comfortable standing on that hand in an environment with lights like in the studio or in a classroom where there may be a lot of loud noise. Um, we have to kind of quote bomb proof our birds. And so um, yeah. we we had to do a lot more work on them last year. And uh, when we were able to bring back our volunteers, which we had to send our volunteers away for a while too, they came back and that was one of their big projects was to really work with our education birds uh, to keep their training up. So, so from that end of things, we stayed busy, you know, just like everybody else we thought Downtime? No, we we really worked and and worked very hard during the whole year for COVID. Yeah. Um, but it yeah. was it, it was a substantial impact on us financially, because our programs we we do charge for our programs. They cost us money and time and effort to be able to do, and so that money didn't come in. Likewise, we didn't have open house events. We generally have three events per year uh, now that each usually bring about a thousand people to the center. We get a lot of donations during those events, but um, we also sell a lot of merchandise during those events and we make some money yeah. off of that as well. And so, you know, all of those things went to zero last year for us pretty much. And yeah. um, so we already kind of went into things with a bit of a deficit for our standard operating uh, money. And I could tell you just right off the bat, you know, even prior to budget cuts, which I know we're going to talk about, um, you know, we we do have a lot of administrative support from the School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Every single day we get a lot of support from them. But when it comes to paying for the medical and the rehabilitative care of these birds, you know, I have to fundraise for that. And so yeah. some of the money that would come in from these events were part of that fundraising. And, and so our fundraising was definitely much lower last year, even though we did a couple of big online Facebook things to try to get more funding. We're also more dif different than other programs. I can't just go out and do a co go fund me, for example. Um, it, I'm just not, not able to do that within the university guidelines. And if I were in another program outside of UC Davis, if I needed money to do something, I could put up a GoFundMe site tomorrow. So right. we, we are challenged it is in some of those ways that, that other centers aren't. Yeah, it, it is a double-edged um, sword. You're, you're, you have support and, and resources at the university, but you're not a nonprofit and you can't, you can't do some of the things that nonprofits do. I do uh, understand a lot of the challenges you just mentioned all too well, running Davis Media Access myself. Um, as we begin to, to wind down, um, to add to all of that, the university has cut a big chunk of funding. And I know from uh, a reading online about this that um, that affects your, your paid operations manager position, which is essential for training volunteers. So um, it, I, I understand it, it is what it is that everyone has had impacts from COVID and a decision was made. So how do you plan to um, chart a path forward from here absent that funding, I imagine that puts a lot more uh, of, of the fundraising onus on your plate directly. 
It does. Um, it, yeah, it pretty much doubles the fundraising efforts that we need on an annual basis. And I only have a single paid employee. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the that money was basically to pay the benefits and the salary of that individual. And yes, they do all the training of the volunteers, but they also oversee all of the rehabilitative care of the birds and make sure that those birds uh, get the care that they need. And so um, we do have an interim operations manager right now off of some funds that I had raised that I thought I was gonna place in another place, but they were general support mm -hmm. funds. So we're using those for this current year uh, to be able to pay for an interim position. But my goals and, and what I've set up are an, an endowment for at least this position. And if I can get this one endowed, then I'm gonna to try to get an education program manager position endowed as well. Um, an endowment meaning that the money generates interest enough that it pays for uh, whatever the need is for, for that particular year, every year in perpetuity. And so, you know, but it takes quite a bit of money to be able to get enough interest to be able to pay the salary and benefits, even for a single person. So we're greatly appreciative to the Davis community uh, with the Davis Enterprise story. A lot of people reached out to us and donated to us, probably in numbers that they wouldn't have donated in the past to us. And a lot of it went to the endowment, a lot went to general funds. And so the ones in general funds are gonna help me get through this year. But my goal is by our 50th anniversary is to be able to get this position endowed. Um, I'll be fundraising for the medical and rehabilitative care probably for a long time. That would be another great endowment to have. But for right now, my, my biggest need is to be able to endow this one position. And um, we do have an endowment fund. Uh, if you like to donate to us, uh, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website. And it will take you to it to show you the different ways that you could help us out. All right, we've got a, a graphic up too with your uh, the URL for your website, which has recently changed, and it is CaliforniaRaptor.org. And I want to thank you for joining us today. I've been speaking with Dr. Michelle Hawkins, director of the UC Davis Raptor Center. I want to tell you, um, I appreciate your all the work that you do to protect these uh, apex predators of, of the bird world, especially in a heavily agricultural um, county such as Yolo. Uh, they are very, very important to our overall uh, ecosystem, to our agricultural system. We, we really can't get by without them. So thank you for the work you do, and thanks for joining us here today and Thank you to so our much, viewers, Autumn. I really appreciate it to our viewers you can uh, find many more interviews and programs like this by going to davismedia.org click on the DCTV stands for Davis Community Television icon you can also subscribe to us at YouTube at Davis Media Access thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time in the studio